Tonight we're going to conclude our series on the Divine Feminine by turning to the religions of Hinduism and Buddhism. And if one wants to see the worship of the Divine Feminine in practice today, no better place than India and Hinduism. Uh, over the centuries, there have been numerous manifestations of this religious impulse to worship the feminine. Uh, and as a result, there's developed complex theology and ritual around the divine feminine. I think it's relatively rare. We saw it in Mary in the, in the Catholic Church, but in Hinduism, you really find uh, a complex theology and ritual around this. And part of it is based on what is known as Shakti. Shakti. Shakti is a primordial cosmic energy. And this energy is thought to be both sustaining and destructive, as all energy is. Energy can be sustaining, it can be destructive. And it's been personified in the form of numerous goddesses. Remember in the first, uh, our first session, I said that a lot of the notion of the divine feminine is sort of a projection out onto the cosmos or the transcendent, the uh, idea that any culture has of feminine. So uh, th this has taken place, and it's symbolically seen in numerous goddesses. I was once told there were 30,000 Hindu goddesses. Yep. So get ready to stay a while. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is cut it down to two. <laughs> Two and two that are, you'll see that they do have a relationship, but they're usually, they have a different emphasis, and they happen to be two of my favorite. And so since I'm teaching, I've decided that these are the two we're going to look at. And these are the goddesses Lakshmi and Kali. So let's start with Lakshmi. The goddess Lakshmi is the consort or wife of the Hindu god Vishnu. So all the gods have their female side. They're usually seen as a wife or a consort, much like the Greek gods did. These are personifications. So Lakshmi is related to Vishnu. The two main theistic gods in Hinduism are Vishnu and Shiva. So Lakshmi is related to Vishnu. As such, she's proclaimed as the goddess of wealth, prosperity, both material and spiritual, Light, wisdom, fortune, fertility, generosity, and courage. What else do you want? <laughs> She's also embodiment of beauty, grace, and charm. So one of her myths of origin, all these gods and goddesses have myths of origin, is as follows. At one time, the devas, who are the lesser gods, and the asuras, the demons, they were both mortal at one time, according to this myth. Uh, and there was this thing called Amrit, which is divine nectar, which would give them immortality if you could have the divine nectar. But it could only be obtained by what was called churning the ocean of milk. And here's the, 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 the symbol. Remember, these are stories and myths. These are all symbolic. You can take them literally, as many people do, but you can also take them symbolically. Um, so, since they both sought for this Amrit, they decided to churn this ocean. The Devas on one side, the Asuras on the other, and the great churning commenced. Vishnu, the high god, incarnated himself as a tortoise. What is that tortoise doing? It's, yeah, it's, the, it's the support, right? The base. So the god is supporting this. Vishnu is supporting it. Kurma, the tortoise. Um, the great venom-spewing serpent is wrapped around the mountain. See the mountain? And then Vasuki begins to churn this ocean. So they're churning it up because the Amrit's down below and they want it to come up and both sides want it. That's the basic story. So 
a host of celestial beings and objects come up during the churning. Now you get symbolically, this is wonderful. When you start churning things, what comes up, even if you want to talk about um, psychology, you start churning up the subconscious, what comes up. In any case, uh, one of these things that came up was the goddess Lakshmi. So the goddess Lakshmi comes up. And then the last to come up was the nectar. So Lakshmi comes up and the nectar comes up. Uh, then Lakshmi distracted the demons, which allowed Vishnu to give the immortality to the devas. And that's how the gods got immortality. So that's her personification. But, and this is always to be remembered, she's also known as Maha Lakshmi. Have you ever heard Maha anywhere? Like in Mahatma? Maha in Sanskrit means great. So Mahatma for Gandhi meant the great soul. Maha Lakshmi isn't the incarnated Lakshmi. Maha Lakshmi is the mother of the universe. Equivalent and part of Vishnu. And this is true within Hindu cosmology. The, the, Male gods always have their female sides. That, and they're usually seen as consorts or wives. But this is Mahalakshmi. So she, is, she can appear as an incarnation in the world. But behind that, she is the eternal underlying essence of all things. And is one with Vishnu in that. Mahalakshmi. Uh, so it's interesting. There are really two sides of the same coin, Vishnu and Lakshmi. Male and female are part of the one total unity. Uh, and her presence is also found on Vishnu's chest. Does that, does he, have you ever seen anything similar to that? In, in Christianity? The heart? The heart. Or the heart of Jesus, yeah, it, related to Mary often, yeah, okay. This, this, deep, this deep connection at the chest. Uh, here she is seen as the embodiment, uh, embodiment of love from which the devotion to God flows. She is the embodiment of love. Uh, since it's through love for Lakshmi that the individual soul reaches Vishnu. Remember, I think I, I've said this several times, in Hinduism, the soul is considered feminine. The gopis in the Krishna worship, which are your soul, are feminine. And the idea is for the feminine to unite with the masculine. And so we see an example of that here as well. Um, Vishnu, in a lot of the myths, is seen as sort of stern father figure type as males often are, whereas Lakshmi is seen as soothing, warm, approachable, a mother type of figure who often intervenes with Vishnu. Where do we see that? <laughs> that notion of Mary, at least in Catholicism, being able to intervene possibly through saying the Hail Mary. Okay. The, this, this notion, and now remember, these are all male images of the female. We've got to always remember that. All the images we have historically of the female basically come from males, because who had the power to create these symbols and these, it was males. So this is, and we always got to remember that. But what do we see here? We see the notion of the mother figure, the soft figure, the one who can console, who can keep daddy at bay, <laughs> if necessary. Yeah. yeah. Let me see. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Ganesh. Yeah, it's Ganesh. Uh, you know, it is Shiva, but Shiva's Vishnu. <laughs> Ultimately, everything is the one. So whatever combination you get, you can, you can see it. You, yeah, it's traditionally in the myths, Ganesh is the son of, of Shiva, but Shiva is actually Vishnu. And Vishnu is actually Shiva, and Lakshmi is actually Shiva. And Lux I mean, it, these are all various perspectives of one whole. That's the idea. In fact, it goes so far as everything 
you, the chair, everything in the universe is a manifestation of the one, ultimately. Okay, so. Um, so she has this soft side, but she's also the personification of spiritual energy, the Shakti. She has that energy, both individually and in the universe as a whole. And this energy empowers and uplifts her and the individual. So she, it isn't just this softness, and that's, I think, where a lot of Hindu feminism differs. There is the powerful side of the goddess. There is the Shakti. We'll get to the real sense of that when we get to Kali. But by and large, Lakshmi is, is seen in, in this way. Now, she has many names. She's generally associated with the lotus. You see. And uh, so, therefore, she has epithets like Padma, Kamala, which are all na various names for lotus. What's interesting about a lotus? Just if you know to say anything about where do the lotuses grow? In the mud, in the muck. So where does the lotus come from? Out of the muck, okay. which is the symbol of the spirit able to arise out of the muck that we call samsara, the muck that we call life. Notice on the one on the left, can you see? This is it. Uh, I don't think, there it is, uh, at the top. You see, he, that's Vishnu, and he's holding up What is uh, looks like a lotus, and on top, that's Lakshmi. The, the myth is that the lotus comes out of his navel, and out of his navel comes the creation. So it's tied in with the creation myth. Yeah, the lotus is the symbol of, yeah, what will we say? Advent, <laughs> the the old, or the growing into the new. The old, the seed in the muck becoming something grand and sacred. It's, it's moving forward. It's always creative. So uh, that's one of, her, one of her main symbols. Um, she has four hands. You notice? Yeah. These are the uh, sim uh, symbols of what are called the four ends of human life. Okay. There's the Dharma or the righteousness. That's your duty. What you should be doing. What your role is. Your social role. Then there's Kama. Who's heard of the Kama Sutra? Kama means desire. Okay? The erotic. That's a, a legitimate end of life for human beings. As long as it's kept in its proper dharmic perspective. And then there's Artha or wealth. That's also a proper end of life. You're supposed to, in, in the four stages of Hindu life, attain wealth. Have a family. And then at the end, you give it all up. And you go to the forest. <laughs> because by that time, it's time to leave. And that's the fourth one is moksha. Liberation. So you live in the world. You partake of it. You partake of its wealth. You partake of its beauty, its erotic nature, within a context that is socially acceptable. But in the end, you want to get off. You don't want to keep going round and round and round and round. You can only win so many Super Bowls. I think Tom Brady is sort of expressing that right now. You know, he's come back, but for what? <laughs> so it, all, it, and she symbolizes that. Yes, life is to be lived. It's to be in, enjoyed. But in the end, there has to be a sense of detachment. Otherwise, then if you're attached to samsara, then it's not ending. So those are her four. She's worshiped daily, but she has a major festival, which is in October. You may have heard of Diwali. It's, uh, it's in October. It's the Festival of Lights. It's one of the most major festivals throughout India. Um, it's celebrated by families. Uh, it's usually part of cl uh, a spring cl uh, in, in, uh, cl cleaning the house and getting lights up and and, it, but it, it's, it's supposed to be um, in celebration of an event when Rama, King Rama, came back victoriously to his capital after having been banished and having fought demons and having had his wife Sita stolen, having recovered her and coming back to ultimate victory, good over evil. 
But who is Sita? A manifestation of Lakshmi. Who is Lakshmi? <laughs> a manifestation of... It. Okay, so it's all one. But this is the male field. And if you go to a, a household, you'll see that you, uh, often there'll be lights. And when I say lights, they're often these little um, uh, lamps. They're called dweeps in, in Hindi. And you, you, this is a fairly elaborate uh, situation. In the villages, there'll just be small lamps. But it's the celebration of good over evil. And Lakshmi is part of that. Okay. Um, lots of temples to her. This is one of the most famous. This is in Chennai. Chennai is the, um, is the, the city in the far south that um, used to be um, Madras. Yeah, Madras. The British called it Madras. Uh, this, is, uh, this temple is known as the Ashta Lakshmi. Ashta means eight. So there the, you see the eight, uh, eight towers, and there'll be eight, uh, eight uh, uh, statues uh, of Lakshmi. And people just go there to offer what is called puja, where you offer some sort of fruit or nuts or something in front of a priest, say a prayer. He'll give you usually a tikka on the forehead. Uh, sometimes, interestingly, sometimes they'll give you something called prasad, which is a little wafer. <laughs> Yeah, you give something to the God, the God gives you back something to eat, to consume. The connection, okay? the, the, the kinetic com, uh, communion type of, of situation. Uh, so like I said, there are numerous uh, temples like this. If you're interested, there is one on Laurel Canyon Boulevard to Lakshmi. I don't have an actual picture of the temple, but that's the, that's the, uh, the statue within. So. Actually, you know, in the last 10 to 20 years, the number of Hindu temples that have gone up in the United States is incredibly large, <coughs> incredibly large. Okay, so that's, that's Lakshmi. You get a little bit of a feel for her. I have a Mary type of figure in some sense, but with a little more, uh, a little more energy, perhaps, towards what we would call the masculine. Then there's Kali. Oh, this is the one that bothers everybody, okay? Um, she, she's the goddess who destroys. Comes from Kala, a Sanskrit term with dual meanings. The first is translated as black or dark colored. And the second is time, destiny, fate, or death. So the first image, the first feeling you probably get when you see Kali is not a positive one, right? Kali is considered the goddess of change and time. What does time eventually do? <coughs> it eats everything. Time consumes everything. Have you ever thought of it that way? Time consumes everything. You will one day not have your form because time will have consumed it. Everything will have its consumption. So she's related to this. It's the recognition that the phenomenal world, the phenomenal world is limited. It will be eaten. We don't like to use that term. It will be consumed. Uh, but in doing that, she is seen as the redeemer of the universe. Kali is one of Sh Shiva's wife or consort is Parvati. Kali is an aspect of Parvati. <laughs> it's like when your wife gets mad or shows another side. That, that soft mother side sort of isn't there for a while. There's, it's a little more energetic. Okay, that, so Kali, and, and as we'll see, initially she was a destroyer of demons. You used to find her on the battlefield. She'd appear on the bat. Now this is an image of femininity that sort of goes against our traditional Western notion, right? Until fairly late. You know. 
She's a goddess. She is part of Shiva. She's Shiva's feminine side, a, a certain perspective of his feminine side, because there's more than one feminine, I mean, there are different perspectives of feminism. Shiva's the god of destruction. destruction. Yeah. yeah. The dance, when he dances in the, yeah. But this, see, we, when we say, when we think of destruction, we tend to think of what? That's negative, right? Yeah, it's supposed to be destruction is necessary for rebirth and transcendence. If nothing were destroyed, what would, <laughs> you'd have no new, you'd have nothing new. So that's where it's destructive and creative at the same time. It's sometimes focused on the destruction. Um, but part of the reason she looks fearful is, remember, the, the human general fear of death and destruction. So this is a, a realistic view of, of how death is often seen. Death usually isn't there smiling. and yeah. Death is seen. It's to be something. But it, it's, if we, it, and this is where the worship comes in, if you understand it, ultimately, she's the mother of the universe. She consumes you in your phenomenal form, but she saves you, if you will, in your spiritual form. She allows you, through physical death, to transcend your ego. So when you see her with her sword and her skulls, the skulls are the ego. The sword is what gets rid of the ego. So. Yeah, there are skull. Yeah, you. Those represent yeah. When it's understood symbolically, you see, if you just see this and don't understand some of the depth, uh, symbolic nature behind it, nearly all that, I, from my study of Hinduism, when we study these things, what it's really, it, there's one level that's external, but it's really talking about what's going on inside. We all have our Kalis, we all have our Vishnus. We all have our skulls, our egos. Okay. So by worshiping Mahakali, she eats time. Time eats everything, but she eats time. So if you are connected with Kali, you are liberated. If you want, we might say saved, but you're liberated from all of this, and eventually all your attachments, all your fears, all your anxieties, she liberates you from those. But she has a fearful image. She has, a, this is, a, when, you, when you go into these temples and see that, it's, it, 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 it's a different type of feminine energy. But ultimately, it's, it's destructive, but salvific, if we call it that. It's there in terms of, of saving one. Are we having a good time? <laughs> Okay. Is there a sword? Is that picture? I see the skull. Uh, she probably, she, that might not have a sword, but let's see if I can get it. Ah, look at that one. She's standing on top of Shiva. Feminists love this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's the god Shiva. She's on top of him. Now remember, she's actually Shiva's Shakti energy. You got to always remember that these divisions that we see on one level ultimately mold back into a unity. The myth always brings it back to its unifying purpose. So uh, there she is with all her arms, and all the arms represent her different powers, you know, and she's standing on top of Shiva. So this, in other words, there are times when our feminine side has to dominate. If we lose that, then we get out of balance. They should uh, ideally both come together, but life is life. And sometimes one dominates, sometimes the other dominates. And here is a sign that she is dominating him, although they're both the same. <laughs> Ultimately, they're both part of the same thing. So just think, if you want to think of it as yourself, do you have a feminine side? Do you have a masculine side? How do those relate to each other day to day? So probably sometimes one is a little more dominant, 
Sometimes the other's a little more dominant. The idea, of course, is some sort of nice balance. And again, what's feminine and what's masculine is going to be culturally determined. But since that's, that's the case, these are myths that try and tell you that when one side dominates, that's okay, as long as it doesn't always dominate, because you don't always see Kali on top of it. Okay. Um, then, yeah. Ah, well, she, it's called the lolling tongue, lapping up time. She's lapping up time. So if time eats everything, she eats time. So she's the savior. She conquers death through death. Now that seems like a paradox, doesn't it? Isn't there a line in Jesus Christ Superstar, the only, something about to die is to die. I mean, the only way to conquer death is to die. Is that, okay. The only way to conquer death is to die. How does that relate to the, uh, the, the, the reincarnation? Yeah, yeah. Eventually, yeah. Eventually you're, you want to stop being reincarnated. Okay. You eventually, it's like eventually you want Tom Brady to retire. <laughs> okay. we, but there's something in us that doesn't want to retire. <laughs> He wants to keep coming back, wants more, 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 more. And as long as you want that more, 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 you will get it. You will get it. It's through Kali, however, that hopefully you, or, and it's not just Kali, it could be through Lakshmi, could be through Shiva, could be through, all of them give you a, a possibility of transcending what is called samsara. This, this, site, this circle that goes around and around and around and around and never stops. Um, but there, she, this is now, but then she can take this form. She can take the form of Parvati, the sweet form. Yeah. I love these things because they really teach me a lot about myself. The difference. Sci, I mean, in fact, I don't even think I have a self. I think I have selves. I think they're different. Like I used to say, it depends who's the chairman this morning. Okay. Sometimes one side of me is going to be dominant. Sometimes another side of me is going to be dominant. We tend to think of ourselves as a self, but you know, probably practically we're, we're a bunch of different selves who sort of have to be molded together somehow. And part of the myth is to help you to do that. Uh, okay, uh, let me say just a little bit about Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna was a famous 19th century saint. Um, and he, this is what he said about, his, his major goddess was Kali. This is what he said. O Mahakali, who in the cremation ground, naked and with disheveled hair, intently meditates upon thee and recites thy mantra, and with each recitation makes offering to thee of flowers, becomes without effort the Lord of the earth and transcends death. She is the symbol of transcending death. Yeah, she's a goddess. She, but remember, even the, per, the personifications that we have, that means the images of the gods, those are transient. What lasts is the underlying one essence, ground of being, which is called Brahman, and all the gods sort of just come out of that. Okay. So it's the ultimate isness of things without a particular identity, which is hard for us to grasp because everything is based on. Sort of young, young oh, oh, definitely. <coughs> definitely. The, that's a good analogy. Yeah, they're universal. Yeah. Now, we might, this is the Hindu representation of those archetypes, yeah. but what you can find. In all religions, these, uh, these symbols of the basic archetypes. Uh, so there she is again with her lovely lolling tongue. Um, I have, uh, does anyone know Fran Elson here? Fran Elson, the artist, the glasswork. She did one of these. She did one of these for me. Yeah. 
and I, I, have, I have her in my study, and I periodically look up at her and say, okay. <laughs> when, when I'm anxious about something, and it seems kind of trivial at the end, you know, there she is. She's, she's the great mother. Um, in, uh, just briefly, she's also worshipped as another goddess called Durga. This is in, in Bengal. Similar, but just a different expression. She rides on a tiger, and she, known as fighting the great demons. Now, who are the demons? On one level, the demons are all these mythological figures, right? But who are the real demons? Your own. Your own. We all have our demons. We all have our Lakshmis. We all have our, okay? And the real, the reality of much of Hinduism is, like I said, is an internal message. When you look at these things, look at them in terms of yourself. Okay. Uh, there's this famous celebration called Durga Puja. One of the biggest celebrations in all of Bengal lasts for a week. Uh, it was going on while I was in uh, Nepal, and uh, everything shuts down. Okay. And at the end of all these celebrations, they immerse her in the water. That's an image of her. They build these great big images, they parade them, and then they immerse them in the water. She drowns. She drowns. But what is that symbolic of? New life. New life. New life out of the water. In the, yeah. Oh, wonderful imagery. Uh, lastly, this is her, the great temple in Calcutta, to Kali. And that's the actual image in that temple. This is the temple where Ramakrishna had his epiphany. I don't know if you know anything about Ramakrishna. When he was a, a, a young boy, he was a priest at this temple. His brother died. His fam all the people were dying around him. And he went into deep, deep, deep despair. He later talks about it as almost being uh, um, psychotic. He, 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 he had just given up. One night, he went in front of this image, this very image, because that's the actual image in that temple, and was going to cut his throat. He was going to commit suicide. He'd, and he had a vision. She says to him, I am in everything. Everything is in me. It's okay. Nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear because you are one with me and I am in everything and everything is in me. Remember the past, uh, when I, the sermon I gave, the, when Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Something very similar. There's this something that holds us together. What keeps us apart is when we feel separate. When we forget this ultimate connection. Which in this symbol, it's the symbol of Kali. She said, it's okay. It's like mother. It's like your mother saying, it's okay. It's okay. It, things will be Okay. I mean, isn't that something we sort of all desire a little bit? That things are going to somehow be okay. And when you're experiencing chaos, that can seem so far away that it leads to despair. So anyway, this was his birth, and he became a great saint, one of the great saints of India. Uh, his uh, disciple, Swami Vivekananda, came and spoke at, in the Chicago uh, World Religion, Parliament of Religions at the end of the 19th century. If you want to go up, there's a temple to this guy up in Montecito, up at the top of um, Sheffield. It's a beautiful grounds. If you want to go up one day, it's a nice day, you go up Sheffield, right up near the top, there's a beautiful grounds, there's a small temple. It looks like a Japanese temple, it doesn't look like a Hindu temple. There's an image of Rama Christian site. Beautiful view of the islands, beautiful gardens. It's run by nuns. It's a very spiritual place. In any case, uh, that's, that's Kali. I think that's the last we have up here. Okay. So that's, that's Hinduism in a quick glance. <laughs> like I said, you could have 33,000 god goddesses, but they're all the same, ultimately. <laughs> they're all the same. Okay. Uh, turning to Buddhism. Um, Buddha doesn't really talk much about gods and goddesses. 
sometimes it's said that Buddhism is sort of atheistic. Uh, there are references in the text. Um, atheistic in one sense. But he does talk about the impermanence of all things, including the self. If the self is impermanent, it can be neither masculine nor feminine. If it's one or the other, that means it's permanent. So this is a constant teaching within Buddhism. Actually, masculine and feminine are cultural notions. There is some physiology behind it, but we're changing all the time, especially in terms of our what we call gender as opposed to uh, just biological sexuality. But there are stories about some of the early nuns. And that's interesting. He allowed nuns into his monastic order. When in India, that was, it was, mon monasticism was for men. The, the Hindu monastics, were, they were all men. It was a rough life, first of all. <laughs> Give up everything. What if I said, okay, when you leave here, <laughs> I'm giving you nothing. You're going out into the world. You're not going home. And you're going to survive on your own. And that's not a, an easy life. Thousands of men do it every year. They're called sadhus. They, we would call them homeless. <laughs> but they're homeless with a spiritual connection. They're doing this out of purpose. And people will support them by giving them alms, because that seemed to be a great merit. But in any case, the Buddha allows uh, nuns into. And there, there were two very famous ones. One we have, her name was Damadina, uh, who was the wife of a merchant. She said uh, she and her husband became Buddhists. And she decided to become what is known as a, a, a bhikkhuni, or a, a, a monk, monkess. Uh, and she did that, and she became enlightened. She became the highest level in, in the monastery. The, uh, her husband progressed, but not as far as she did. She was known as the non-returner. She had transcended all attachment and came very close to attaining enlightenment. Um, there's a tradition where Damadina was actually giving a talk. Buddha asked her to give a talk, which again was unusual. Uh, the Buddha listened silently, and after the talk, he said he could not have expounded the teachings any better. Now, that's pretty good praise. <laughs> what century? The sixth century BC. Yeah. BC. BC, yeah, yes. This is, um, and then there was another, Upalavana, renowned for her beauty in whom the Buddha is said to have declared the foremost in spiritual power amongst the nuns. What's going on here? She's being chased by Mara. Mara is the Buddhist equivalent of Satan. He's trying to tempt her. He's trying to tempt her into giving up the life of, of a nun. And according to the, uh, the, the tradition, this is what she says to him. Though a hundred thousand rogues just like you might come here, I stir not a hair. I feel no terror. Even alone, Mara, I don't fear you. I can make myself disappear or I can enter inside your belly. I can stand between your eyebrows, yet you won't catch a glimpse of me. Because, and here is the key, I am the master of my own mind. Nothing can affect you. I think Empedocles said this, if you don't allow it. You have to, just think about that. No one can make you unhappy. No one can make you anything unless you agree to it psychologically. If you accept that that will happen, it might happen. But that's the power of the mind. So this is a type of, temptation always isn't just the level we think. Temptation can be someone trying to make you afraid. Who controls fear, ultimately? You. You can choose not to be afraid. Now, it might be difficult, but you can do it. So, uh, 
this is the early Theravada tradition. Then we get into Mahayana. That's the, the great vehicle. Uh, and then we start to get goddesses. Uh, Again, lots of goddesses, probably influenced by Hinduism. Uh, I just want to make mention of three. Uh, one is Vasudhara, the other is Tara, and the third one you may have heard of, Kuan Yin. And so let's say a little bit about each of these. Uh, Vasudhara, whose, ne whose name means stream of gems in Sanskrit, stream of gems, she's a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva in Mahayana was a spiritual being who had become enlightened, gone unto another realm of existence, gotten out of this mess, but then chooses to come back and help people. So bodhisattvas are known for their ultimate compassion. They've gained nirvana, they've gained enlightenment, but uh, not until everyone is brought on. That's why it's called Mahayana the great vehicle. Earlier Buddhism, it was sort of the individual monk enlightening himself and getting out of this mess. Mahayana says, until everyone is brought out. So it's the great vehicle of compassion. So she was a great bodhisattva. Uh, and she's very popular in Nepal. I saw lots of images of her in Nepal. Uh, all sorts of legends about her. She gives wealth, but the legends are interesting. There's one story about how she gives wealth to a, a, a monk. But what does he do with his wealth? Does he go out and buy a BMW? He puts it back into the monastery. He puts it back into serving others, and therefore she continues to give him wealth. The notion being, we will give you wealth as long as you are not greedy. <laughs> as long as you share what you have. This is the message of the bodhisattva. Um, we often see, that these are just beautiful artistic images of her with all the arms and... Um. Then we have Tara. Tara in Japan is known as Tarani Bodasu. There she is. But it's really in Tibet that we find Tara come to the fore. And there are three Taras. The green Tara, the red Tara, and the black Tara. Um, and they all, they all represent different aspects of quote unquote femininity, from healing and serenity, to wealth and prosperity, to anger. Okay. All three are, are found. And there's numerous stories of her as a, as a bodhisattva. Um, her name actually means, I like this, moon of primordial awareness. <laughs> Isn't that a nice phrase? The moon of primordial awareness. What would primordial awareness be? A sort of inner intuitive awareness of things. Not here. A primordial awareness of who you really are. Um, and there are all sorts of stories of her existing in different world systems. In Mahayana Buddhism, this isn't the only universe. In fact, there are millions of them. Early Indian, Indian thought, Buddhist thought, tended to see things very large. They spoke of billions of years and millions of universes. We're just a little speck. And you know, from what we're coming to see of the cosmos, that's probably pretty true. You know, you look at what the, the web Webb telescope is showing us. At one level, yes. Okay. So the Buddha, there's all these myths about it, and she's at different levels of the universe. Um, and again, the, the, you can remember these are myths. She stays in meditation for 10 million years. Now that's what we'd call a bit of an exaggeration. But the notion is the power of deep meditation and what it will do for your life. Every school of Buddhism that I know of places emphasis on meditation in one form or another. At the going inward. Meditative prayer, if you want to call it. Stop always being out there. 
Come inside. Come visit yourself. You might be surprised. In any case, um, this is what the, uh, the Dalai Lama said of her in 1989 in Newport Beach. There is a true feminist movement in Buddhism that relates to the goddess Tara. Following her cultivation of supreme compassion, the Bodhisattva's motivation, she looked upon the situation of those striving towards full awakening, that's enlightenment, and she felt that there were too few people who attained Buddhahood as women. So she vowed, for all my lifetimes along the path, I vow to be born as a woman. And in my final lifetime, when I attain Buddhahood, then too I will be a woman. And that's from the Dalai Lama. <laughs> There's also one other side to her. There's this playful side to her the playful side. Uh, she's sometimes depicted as a young 16-year-old girl who interrupts the lives of serious meditators who are taking themselves too seriously. <laughs> you know, there is that sense of spirituality, and I'm not trying to undermine spirituality, where you take it so seriously that you kind of miss the point and you kind of lose the joy of things because you're, you're, you're trying to be so perfect and do everything right and be spiritual. Well, she has this side of herself. Now, I'm going to show this to you. You've got to remember this is symbolic. <laughs> this is a famous image of Tar called the Yub Yum. Now, you can say it's erotic. Okay, it has it. It's an erotic side. She's sitting on top of the bodhisattva. It's not a lap dance. Okay. What this is, is the coming together of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom without knowledge, what does that mean? But knowledge without wisdom can cause all sorts of problems. You've got to have the two together. So that's what this image is symbolic of. And that's Tara on top of uh, a male figure. It's not quote unquote sexual in the sense that we would understand it. It's the coming together, the union of knowledge and wisdom. Okay, I want to move to our last one. And this is Quan Yin. Sometimes called Quan Yin. Uh, it was said that she was the daughter of a cruel king. This is the myth, who wanted her to marry a wealthy, uncaring merchant. What was the king interested in? Money and wealth. He wanted his daughter to, to be well off. Uh, she said she would, but uh, if, 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 if marriage would take care of the three misfortunes of life. You said, what are those? The first misfortune marriage should ease was the suffering of people as they get old. Can marriage get rid of suffering as you get old? No. The second would ease the suffering of people when they fall ill. You can be there to help, but that's not going to solve it. And the third, the suffering caused by death. So. What, she said, I'll marry you if, if, if that's what marriage will do. And of course, it can't do those. Now what's interesting, those are the three visions of Buddhism. Those are the three visions that the Buddha has. Old age, illness, and death. Marriage can't overcome those. So she doesn't get married. So she wants to go into the monastery. And her father is not happy about this. And he tries to get the... Uh, the monks to treat her as badly as they can. Give her the worst jobs. They may drive her out. She accepts them with all the grace that she can. She's, she gets through that test. Um, this is sort of the, the test of the hero. If you know anything about Joseph Campbell, the hero always has to go through a number of tests. Uh, finally, the fa uh, father in, in ultimate despair uh, tells the executioner to get rid of her. Kill her. 
Just as he's about to bring down the axe and hit her, it shatters. Now this is a myth. Or this is a myth. It doesn't have to be taken literally. It shatters. Then uh, he tries to drown her. That doesn't work. So all the, he goes through all these attempts, and of course, she is victorious. So what is it, if we don't take that literally, what is it symbolic of? Overcoming. The power you have to overcome okay, within you. And this is a, a, a female. So she eventually becomes a, a bodhisattva. She attains enlightenment. But as a bodhisattva, she has vowed not to just take salvation. She will come back and help. And so when you often see her in images, you'll see her with her vase. You see the vase in her arm? Can you see that? With the flower? The vase is up there. That's the vase of compassion. She pours out compassion into the world. And the other one that you'll see, that's my goddess. She's got a thousand hands. Okay, I don't know if you can see them, but all these little, they're all hands. So we'll end with the vow that she makes. And this is her vow. Never will I seek nor receive private individual salvation. Never will I enter into final peace alone. But forever and everywhere will I live and strive for the redemption of every creature throughout the world from the bonds of conditioned existence. I don't know of a broader vow in any religion. Okay? The vow is to save everyone, if we want to use that term, to liberate everyone. And you will not be happy or at peace until that happens. Yeah, Chris? <clears throat> Another vow of Kuan Yin is as long as earth endures and as long as sentient beings exist, may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Yeah. yeah. Chris is, a, I think, a manifestation of... <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm not... You're on the path, my dear. <laughs> Much further than I am, let's put it that way. Uh, a little bit like the Great Commission. So everybody. Mm. Mm. Everyone. Yes. And, and not only that, you won't be happy until everyone. I guess it would be like if you thought of everyone as being your child. You know, would you want to leave one of them behind? Probably not. Yeah. Question. I wonder, does that kind of sum up Buddhism? Is that what they aspire to? Compassion. Compassion. Compassionate. That's the ultimate goal. To be, and eventually it's seen as a liberation from self. Because when you're, com when you're filled with compassion, you're not focusing on what? Me. You're not focused. And that's, that's the, the general notion of Buddhism. The, I think any religion ultimately is the worst enemy really is ourselves. And it, we, have, if we, we have to get out of that. We have to identify with something larger, something bigger, something worth living for rather than well, whatever. Yeah. Uh -huh. Back to Hinduism. Mm -hmm. From what you said, I got the impression that their lives, they want to go on and on and on. Who makes the decision to finally get off? <laughs> you. The individual has to. And the individual has to by living a certain life that's removed from attachment, is compassionate, and then you'll find out when you die. <laughs> well, what's happened is that this has sort of become put in relationship to the caste system. Uh, I think this is a degradation of the religious idea, actually, over time. that. The lower you are in the social order, uh, generally it means the lower you are spiritually. And so you, you have the hope in your next life of working yourself up and up and up and then finally getting going. I personally, I think that's a bit of a degradation of the ultimate spiritual idea behind it. Yeah, and Gandhi did too. And that's what he called 
the untouchables, Harijans, children of yeah. God. Yeah. But beyond the caste system, mm -hmm. is there a sense of uh, what each cycle is to free, or it's to gain a, a greater sense mm -hmm. of a spiritual, you know, growth. Yeah. 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 You, you, don't, you don't attain it. In a single no, you don't. You don't. No, yeah. you don't. In fact, you know, even Buddhist enlightenment, there's, you know, it is enlightenment is something that happens. It's not an event. It's a process. And the other thing is, I mean, if you have lots of lives, that can take a little bit of anxiety away. Okay? <laughs> You got, you got time to work on this. Now that can be a negative. You can say, well, I don't, I don't have to worry about it. But, you know, it's, I, 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 all, I think that Hindu thought has always been in large numbers. It's always seen the universe as very large, very old, millions of years old. If they were, Hindus knew the universe was millions of years old when we thought it was, in the West, it was being taught as 6,000. Okay? They've always had this notion of large numbers. I don't, I don't know if it makes any sense, but some of the great mathematicians in the world come out of India. And so, yeah, it's, there is reincarnation, and there are various interpretations of reincarnation from, from what I think are the more spiritual to sometimes the more unjust. The idea that you did something, you, the, the reason you are what you are now is you did something bad in your last life, and I don't have to worry about you. You, you'll take care of it with your own karma. You know, that's, that, and Gandhi was very much opposed. He thought that that was a misunderstanding of reincarnation. Actually, if you think of, re, rather than thinking of reincarnation as something that happens after death, think of it as something that's happening right now. Isn't that such as confessing our sin and not going back and doing it again and being reborn? Yeah, the, the rebirth, yeah. But just think, we're constantly being quote unquote reborn. Just physically, I think we lose all our um, cells every, what, six years or something? I mean, either, we are constantly being, quote, unquote, reborn. So if you just, are, have you ever looked at yourself when you were five? What kind of connect? I mean, there are a few connections, but I, some, I look at pictures of myself, or just, I can remember a few thoughts I had when like, oh, I was five. Is that me? Really? Or is that some image I have of me? So we're always changing. So that's a type of re, we're always being reborn. You just take that out to the notion that what we call physical death is just another step in the process. And we don't completely understand it. But the one thing you can do is you can look at life in general. Life is continually being reborn. Continual creation. Creation didn't just happen once. We live in a cosmos of continual creation. Part of that is destruction of certain aspects. But as a totality, there's creation. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay. Um, Next week, we're switching gears a little bit. We were going to take a week off, but we decided not to. So I'm going to be talking uh, three, three classes on uh, 20th century theologians, two Protestants and one Catholic. We're going to start with uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer next week, followed by Paul Tillich. And then we'll look at Jean-Dominique Croissant, the Catholic. He's a theologian thinker. A scholar. So we'll, we'll do that over the next three weeks. And then you will be doing something on uh, the Advent series on uh, as we approach the Christmas season mm -hmm. and a lot of the uh, uh, many of the symbols that they receive during Christmas is the, the, the understanding of, uh, of the angelic figures. And so we'll be doing a, uh, well we had planned with four weeks but because of we were deciding to hold a, uh, the, the uh, Blue Christmas, uh, the longest night uh, service on the fourth Tuesday. Uh, we're going to have three classes, uh, and those will be teaching one of them, on the, uh, the angelic figures in our, uh, in our uh, Christmas stories. Okay, thanks for coming tonight. <laughs>